50 lakhs before the 31st of March. Take the balance consideration, put it in something what is known as the capital gains account scheme. And in the next year, out of that, purchase another 50 lakhs worth of bonds. I do agree that those bonds don't provide those kind of great returns that one would expect. But the nevertheless, saving of tax is a substantial consideration that we businesses or we Indians really think of. And that aspect also has been curtailed by this amendment in this year. So anybody who looks to sell a particular asset and invest in bonds, they have changed the classification and said it's going to be investment of 50 lakhs against a particular sale, irrespective of the year in which you put it in. So I sell a house in July. This year or the next year, I'll be able to claim only 50 lakhs worth of savings against that. And that's, that's going to, again, bring down the opportunity of investment in these bonds. These bonds are actually used for the development of the country and really the funds that were being pumped in were mainly looking, uh, the source of which was looked off, looked forward by uh, selling of properties and people looking at it as a tax saving investment. Those opportunities are now going to come down. Next slide. There is another major amendment which has, uh, which is of far greater importance, and I would say it's it's very positive. One of the few positive amendments this year. Uh, we've had situations where uh, in the past, if I've failed to deduct TDS, or if I've failed to pay the TDS which I've deducted, I would not be able to claim those expenses in that year against my income from business. Uh, this was leading to a lot of difficulties because. The last few years have been fairly taxing on any business. Recovery, recoveries have been slow. Tax demands have been very high. The government has been fairly aggressive on all fronts, whether we talk about income tax, whether we talk about sales tax, whether you talk about PF and so on and so on and so forth. So the businesses today were spending more than 50% of their time on compliances to help probably the businesses to focus more on growth, which is what is going to help the country at the end they have decided that let us try and look at the amendment and there are s several cases which are very subjective today if i'm making payment towards a particular professional or acquisition of a software now many a times we are not aware that acquiring a software will require tds implications one would think it's a purchase of an asset how is it how is it that i am supposed to deduct tds on acquisition of an asset but software is one such thing where we are not buying an asset. We are only acquiring right, which is there to that software. We are not purchasing the software, so to say. So it's a license agreement that one signs and most of us don't really have the opportunity to go through it. It's just, yes, 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 and we just do an I agree. It's more or less what we do to the terms of our sanction when it comes from the bank as well. It's, yes, I agree. Now, um, when we do that, what we are doing is we are just accepting the terms to a license agreement. And that is what we, in in the terms of the Income Tax Act, call that we are paying royalty towards acquisition of a software. So many of you all may have AutoCAD or specialized software of Adobe or, or, or the likes. Um, most of you all would be acquiring licenses on a year on year basis. Some of those you will be required to withhold taxes on. In case you all have not already done, this amendment was there last year also. I just thought it's important for me to bring it out. Interest on banks obviously are exempt from withholding, but sometimes you all will have a situation where you all have car loans in the business uh, taken from an NBFC, a Sriram Transport, or a Chola Mandalam, or a Kota, so to say. Now, these NBFCs, the interest is not exempt the way we would otherwise for TDS purposes. So on those interests also you are required to withhold and so on and so forth. There are several such situations where TDS implications are not always known to us. And as uh, good businesses, we tend to overlook these things, relying on probably our chartered accountant to take the call. But at the end of the year, there is very little that a CA can do unless he is engaged with you on a monthly or a quarterly basis. So the implication earlier was that the entire amount was going to be disallowed. The finance minister in his speech in the budget, in the bill, he provided that only 30% of this will be disallowed. Fortunately so, while the act was being discussed in both the House or the parliaments, it was so decided that we'll increase that threshold and we'll say that, no, we want to, uh, we, will, we will not uh, disallow 30%, but we'll disallow 40%. So now the threshold is that instead of 100% disallowance, 
you are now going to have a disallowance of 40 percent on items which either you fail to deduct tax on or if you have deducted you have not paid for whatever reason the situation that i have i have brought about is what if the tds has been deducted but not paid before the date of filing of the return we've discussed this bit what if there are short deductions instead of non deductions now here is where the intricacy is i had to deduct 100 rupees on a payment of 1000 i have deducted 80 rupees does that mean i'm subject to disallowance because the section clearly talks about failure to withhold or failure to pay i have withheld i have paid but there has been a short deduction now here is where the challenge lies and personally in my view it should come to your benefit where one can say that if you're not sure about the rate of tax deduct and pay and there at least you have an opportunity of getting the entire amount claimable against your expense rather than being at the risk of a 30 percent or a 40 percent allowance earlier it was a hundred percent disallowance there are also situations and uh, decisions of the court which say that if i have failed to deduct tax but the the person to whom i have made the payment he has paid his taxes by way of advance tax or otherwise the government has got whatever was due am i still liable for interest penalties disallowances and the likes now there have been cases and decisions of the court which say that no you're not uh, you would be allowed those expenses because at the end the government is concerned with collection of taxes you as a deductor are purely acting as an agent on behalf of the the government and not in terms of being the person responsible for paying the taxes in such a situation um, if the deductee has paid his tax earlier the the condition was or the the decisions of the court are that you would still be allowed but what happens is that you, again it increases the compliance that you are required to do maintain that kind of document that the person whoever you have paid to has paid his taxes you communicated to him that there has been a situation where we failed to deduct tax on your case and maintaining those records is is an is a cumbersome activity for any business so strengthening your back office or your accounts team is going to be an increasing requirement for most businesses so if the deductee has paid his proper tax on his income one can claim the shelter of those decisions and say that this amount is not deduct uh, not a disallowance in my case but most of you all i believe would be subject to tax audit so you will have to have that kind of correspondence with your uh, counterparty make sure that the documentation there and the tax auditor is convinced with your arguments that we have done whatever was required as far as payment of taxes are concerned the other bit is the challenge is about payment to non residents now this is where most of us have got immediate payment deadlines or advance payment to acquire something especially items like software designs or payment to a particular technical expert who's there outside uh, now when we are doing si situations like this one would ideally expect the taxes to be withheld and then paid but when it comes to negotiation on a commercial basis it is always seen that the person to whom you are paying has got no interest whatsoever in the indian tax laws he is not concerned with having to manage to file a return in india he doesn't want to deal with the indian tax authorities because we are the most aggressive in the world there is nobody to compete with us on that field now what happens is that then in that case you are making that payment let's say you are supposed to pay a thousand dollars to somebody you will make that thousand dollar payment without deducting tds and you will have an additional cost of paying the tds as an as a cost to you so effectively your cost of that service or that software is going to be the cost that you are paying plus the additional cost of the tds that you were to deduct but you now you are paying on behalf of the person it involves a complicated calculation of grossing up making sure that the appropriate working of the amount of tds is done so i would probably suggest that we are very careful as far as this is concerned but the section that we are talking about right now is about disallowance and this section purely talks about payment to a resident so in case there is a situation where in your business you have made payment to a non resident and your auditor comes and tells you that this is a disallowance because of you've not withheld or you've not paid the condition under that section is very clear it says payment to a resident and it is not covering non resident so even if you've not paid to a non resident there are other implications but not under this particular section next the income tax department has now gone and ventured into something which i call that 
they are they are trying to be very innovative they are trying to be uh, beyond aggressive they are trying to be the ones who are setting the law for the country now accounting standards we have personally experienced that the department has still yet to come to terms with the existing accounting standards and the generally accepted auditing and accounting practices that we have been following now for 65 years they are now proposing to set up their own standards and they, that is what they call as the income computation and disclosure standards now what is it that this has an implication for you every entity which is subject to audit or is meeting that particular threshold will have to comply with this requirement which means if you are a company if you are a private limited company you are going to have to comply with the companies act which prescribes its own set of standards you are going to have to comply with standards that otherwise you are following as historical standards generally accepted accounting policies and for the purposes of taxation now you are going to have to prepare your books as per the needs of the government for the tax purposes it is additionally going to create that much of a hurdle for businesses to try and keep maintaining accounts in different formats different aspects now all of you all are uh, had banking experiences and you know for a fact that the bankers generally look at a coherence between what is the income disclosed in your tax returns and what is the income that is appearing in a profit and loss account imagine a situation where that is going to differ and you're going to have to explain to your bankers at every stage why there is a difference and that is going to entail more and more complications and documentation at your end of course the fact that bankers will also now have to try and understand that the tax return is going to look differently it's going to have its own set of parameters for considering what is income what is revenue what are expenses and that is just unheard of now we know for a fact that when you are today ill equipped to manage the present standards why is it that you are coming up with your own standards and that's where probably i believe that as a trade association uh, some representation if it goes from the industry body that this is something that you should leave to the domain of maybe the institute of chartered accountants or the authority that sets accounting standards or auditing standards for the country as a whole instead of having separate sets of standards being prescribed for various things today we have the income tax setting its own tomorrow we'll have excise doing their own it cannot work this way we would like to have a certainty as far as even what we are recognizing and calling income in our books next please this is a uh, corporate social responsibility has been the talk of the town for the last a year or two we've uh, seen large companies talk about in supporting society looking at investments looking at spending money for the benefit of the downtrodden and doing activities which are uh, going to uplift their own community their own staff things like that so corporate social responsibility has been introduced in a formal way under the new companies act uh, we are going to have a speaker talk about it so i won't delve deep into what is csr but just to take you through it from the perspective of taxation it is basically something that you are going to spend because you are required to spend it under a law you are mandatorily required to spend this because the law says if you don't you are required to explain to your board or your shareholders why you have not done it in a private limited company we say big difference i am the director i am the shareholder it's not so much for me to put the same thing on paper and say i'm justified but nevertheless when it comes to an additional reporting that the roc requires why you haven't done it and then the complications that arise that you are answerable to someone else as to why this has not been carried out and and so on and so forth the fact of the matter is and the discussion the point here and that i've that i've tried to bring out is when something is mandated under the law one would ideally expect that the income tax department or the finance minister would give an encouragement to that and say that yes we would want the private sector to play a part in the growth of the nation and try and help the needy and the downtrodden to bring their social status up it just so happened that this budget he has not brought it out so very specifically in his speech but when you go through the finance act he has very categorically said that the spending on csr would not be an allowable expenditure because he believes that the government should not subsidize one third approximately of what you are spending for the development of this nation now it's a very narrow and a very short sighted approach that i can really think of giving that 33% advantage can go a long way in people really looking at it as as a formal activity 
rather than just something that is mandatory i can do lot of things which are mandatory just for the sake of compliance but one really feels the need that we need to do something for society we need to do something for people who are are not so very fortunate as all of us here and those efforts we are doing as part of our own custom tradition and the act recognizing it itself represents the values of the indian culture one would have thought that that cultural change would also be there in the income tax act but um the finance minister has said any expenditure on csr would not be allowable the discussion point here is slightly further now there have been cases in the past where there were two decisions of the supreme court and of the bombay high court uh, it were pertaining to certain electrical and distribution companies um now those cases there was a requirement under the electricity supply act to create a particular reserve for the benefit of society and those reserves at that point in time the department challenged saying that we will not